you know, a brief introduction, as was just mentioned, you know, we're the Office of Global Services. My name is Sam. Uh, Alex will be taking over a bit later in the presentation. Uh, but yeah, we're from the Office of Global Services and just want to give you a brief introduction and kind of overview to OPT, how to apply, the regulations that you're going to have to follow uh, as you navigate the process. Um, but yeah, and we're always here uh, in on the third floor of Richards Hall. So if you have questions or you have further questions after this presentation, you want more clarifications, just come and give us a visit and we'll be happy to help you and answer any questions you might have. Okay. Hoping my screen isn't being shared now, but we're going to dive right in. So as I just mentioned, uh, in this session, we'll, we hope to explain, you know, just the rules and regulations surrounding OPT, uh, the application process, and other useful reminders to, you know, keep in mind as you proceed and head towards graduation, uh, likely this fall. Um, but yeah. So just starting off, what is OPT? Uh, OPT stands for Optional Practical Training. Uh, all the words there are very relevant and important to remember. Uh, as it indicates, the first word is optional. It is optional. So if you are not interested in pursuing OPT at following graduation, if you want to start a new program or transfer or just return home, that is completely up to you. It is not a requirement for you know your degree or anything like that that you pursue OPT. It is also important to remember that it is a benefit and it is not guaranteed. For a myriad of reasons, you might there's a potential that you could be denied or you're not eligible for OPT. So uh, the expectation should not be that just because you completed a program at Northeastern, you are automatically entitled to OPT. It is tied to you know the valid maintenance of your F1 status. Um, so that's important to keep in mind. Uh, but yeah, so with OPT, uh, authorization will be granted to you as a graduated F1 student uh, by the US Citizenship and Immigration Services, which we will refer to as USCIS. So if you hear that acronym, just remember that's gonna be the people approving your employment authorization and issuing your employment authorization document or EAD card. Um, if granted, the authorization will give you 12 months of approval uh, for post-completion OBT. If you have completed any uh, practical training during your degree program, such as all right, pretty much only the option would be for pre-OPT, then the time you spent on pre-OPT will deduct from that 12 months. So if you've done pre-OPT, it won't be the full 12 months after graduation, but in general, you are eligible for 12 months of practical training. Um, and a force, this is also once per education level. So if you're a bachelor student, you have 12 months. If you then go on to the master's level, you have another 12 months, PhD, same thing. Uh, but yeah, and it's only, uh, post-OPT is only granted obviously after you complete graduation. So if you need to extend your program uh, further into the future, do you need to then wait for your actual graduation date to apply and become eligible? Diving further into, you know, uh, the eligibility requirements, uh, there are three main things we're going to touch on, and we'll go uh, we'll listen briefly here, then go into a little bit further context uh, in the next coming slides. Uh, but the first to remember is you need to have maintained valid F1 student status throughout the entirety of your program. Uh, you know, that's just maintaining on-ground presence, making sure that you, uh, you know, met all the degree requirements, all that fun stuff. Number two is making sure that you've had studied in the U.S. full-time for at least one academic year. Certain students, for whatever reason, uh, have programs that could be technically shorter than that one year, or they might take a break on a leave of absence and return following a, you know, in only completing six months or a single semester after returning from that leave of absence. Unfortunately, in those cases, it's their student will often not be eligible for OBT. So it's important to remember that you need to have been in the U.S. and completing a program of study in the one year exactly prior to your application for OBT. And then the third requirement we're going to touch on is uh, making sure that you have not completed or rather that you've not been authorized for more than 364 days of full-time curricular practical training, also known as CPT. If you have crossed that threshold and, enter, and gone into 365 days, which you are eligible to do, you're able to go beyond that, uh, min that maximum, it just means that you're jeopardizing or invalidating your potential for OBT. Um, so, but as long as you haven't, as long as you meet all these requirements, you should be eligible to apply for OBT. All right, and now 
going further into the maintenance of status, uh, as mentioned, you need to have completed at least one year of academic one academic year here in the U.S. Um, and so what that means for, is two semesters. So in a semester based program, so that would normally be, you know, fall and spring or whatever order you'd like to do them or three quarters in a quarter based system. So CPS students, that will be you know, fall, winter, spring or some combination of those three semesters to become eligible. You must also maintain full time enrollment requirements in each of those required terms. Uh, what counts as a required term varies from program to program. Uh, so it's important to, you know, check in with your academic advisors. But for the most part, you know, required terms are for semester based programs, fall and spring. Uh, and then summer is not counted as one of those required terms. So as long as you've maintained full time enrollment for you know, fall and spring, then you should be good to go. Uh, so, yeah. If your program start date listed on your I-20 for the fall 2022 semester, for example, you must have maintained a full time course load during each of those following terms, uh, unless otherwise, you know, approved for a reduced course uh, or a reduced course load, which you should know. Uh, but your academic advisor can confirm, and our office can also likely confirm if you were approved for one of those reduced course loads. Um, but yeah, your requirements would be then fall 2022, spring 2023, fall 23, spring 24, and then fall 24. So meeting all of those likely means that you're, you maintain your status and you'd be eligible. And then the last part of this is also full-time enrollment. So as you likely know already, the minimum requirement for graduate students is eight credits hours per semester or 12 for undergraduates. Um, and a big trip, uh, a big thing that trips students up often is the online requirement as well. Uh, we don't, you cannot have been over enrolled in online courses and neglecting your on ground presence. So for, you know, an eight credit hour student to that, that minimum, you have to have at least completed one on ground. Uh, any courses beyond that, um, like multiple courses online beyond that could jeopardize your eligibility for your OPT because you have potentially violated your status. So those are all important things to consider uh, as we review your application. We'll, of course, look into your course registration. So uh, we'll be in communication with you, uh, but just it's good to, you know, before you apply to double check yourself, um, work with your academic department, make sure that you've you know, met all the necessary requirements. All right, and now just diving a bit into the application process itself. Uh, the first part of the process is you, again, communicating with your academic department and specifically your academic advisor to complete the certificate of program completion. Uh, this form, this document is very, fairly straightforward. It's just confirming when you, your expected graduation date is, uh, and that your that your uh, academic advisor will sign off that you have completed all the requirements for graduation. You then take this signed document, which is signed by both you and the academic advisor, and you will apply to our office for a recommendation I-20. In that submission to our office. It'll also ask for proof that you have paid the post-graduation fee. Uh, this is just an administration fee that you pay to the university to make sure we maintain your records and keep your student status active while you are on OPT, because uh, otherwise, you know, we wouldn't necessarily consider you still, uh, you know, engaged with Northeastern as a whole once you're following your graduation. Uh, and yeah, uh, in applying to our for the I-20 with our office, you also have to determine which start date you exactly want for your OBT. Um, so this can be a little tricky for students because if you do not have a job offer lined up, uh, it's, you know, it can be difficult to know when exactly is the best date for you to select as your start date. Um, but you can pick anywhere from immediately after your program completion date, which is, you know, if you're graduating uh, December 19th, you can pick December 20th as the very first day you're eligible. Uh, and then anywhere up through the 60 day grace period um, following the end of your, your program. So you have that 60 day window to pick a start date. Uh, if you don't have an, an employer lined up necessarily, then we often see students pick a later day in that grace period to give you a little wiggle room. But after this date is picked and we issue the I-20 and then you submit it to USAS, there's no changing this date. So, uh, that's something to consider. So select a date and then moving forward, you're not going to be able to change it because you heard back from an employer. Um, so you're kind of you're stuck with that once you request it and apply. So just keep that in mind. 
Uh, and then to actually request the I-20 from our office, you can do that in my OGS, where you find all your other uh, e-forms that you've submitted in the past, whether it be travel signature requests, uh, you know, CPT authorization, all of them are in the same little hub there. Uh, OPT and all the required e-forms related to OPT actually have their own specific section called Post OPT Central, uh, just to keep it in a more, you know, more centralized within a specific hub, so you're not getting confused in the MyOGS website constantly. And the last thing to consider here with the application process is that after receiving this I-20, within 30 days, you must then submit the I-765 application for the employment authorization to USCIS, either online or by mail. Now that they accept online applications, we find that most students do apply online, though there is still a physical mail option. But regardless, we want to make sure that you have submitted and it has been received by USCIS within that 30 days after submitting, or after you have received the I-20 from our office. If you wait and submit it on day 32, let's say, USCIS will review your application and will likely issue you a denial. Obviously, we don't want to see any denials, especially one that is pushing up towards the end of your grace period because then you're not going to have the ability to reapply. So make sure you apply pretty soon after receiving the I-20 from our office uh, and just constantly being in touch with us if anything changes or if you need to make any changes to your application. Um, just make us aware so we can you know, assist you the best we can. And here's another visualization of the application timeline and just general OPT timeline. Um, so. In essence, you have a 150 day window to apply for OBT. The 150 days comes from a 90 day window prior to your program end date. So again, if your program end date is December 19th, you can roughly start applying three months before that. So that's where the 90 days comes in. You reach out to our office, submit all the required, you submit the required e-form, we give you the I-20 and then you can submit it to USIS. The earlier, the better. Um, it gives you obviously much more time if you were to receive a denial or if there were any hangups, um, because obviously the application with our office can take 10 to 15 business days to process for us to give you the I-20. The application then with USAIS can take you know anywhere from a month to multiple months. So doing it early is often better and just gives you a lot more flexibility and prevents any last minute rushes or changes that you need to make. Um, but yeah, as long as you they receive that uh, application within 30 days of our recommendation, there shouldn't be an issue there. Um, and again, you have 60 days after your program end date to also apply. So if you do want to wait or decide to wait to, so that you can communicate further with employers, get a better idea uh, of when your potential start date could be, you do have that option to wait. Uh, though obviously the longer you wait, the more risk is involved if, again, if you do receive a denial, because uh, you won't be able to reapply. Once you reach, the, the, once you pass the 60 days grace period, you are no longer eligible to apply for post OPT. Uh, so that is a thing to consider. Um, there's this, you're going to receive a denial if you submit it on day 61. Uh, if you ever, as long as you apply before the end of the grace period, even if it is not approved, you will still, your request will be still be valid and will be considered. Uh, so don't worry if you haven't received the employment authorization document from USAIS before the end of those 60 days. It can still be pending. It just needs to have been received by them. Uh, the last thing to note here is that all post OPT applications uh, or all post OPT employment authorizations will be capped at 14 months after your I-20 program end date. So this takes into consideration those 60 days. Uh, so if you select a OPT start date of exactly 60 days after your program end date, you're then eligible for 12 months of OPT. So those 60 days plus 12 months equals 14 months of total time. If, and this can become confusing for some students, if you apply for OPT and it takes USCIS longer to process it, it can take them a couple months, like I said. Um, some students aren't approved for that full 12 months there because Again, all OPT authorization windows are capped at 14. Even if it is on USAIS, it's, if they're the reason it's taking too long, there's just unfortunately nothing we can do to extend it beyond that 14 months. So uh, another reason just to apply as early as possible to make sure that there's no delays in them approving your application. 
here's just another view at the or a view at the certificate of program completion I mentioned. Um, so this is what you will fill out with the assistance of your academic advisor. Um, so yeah, uh, the form. I, I guess this isn't for undergraduate students, uh, or it is, but you don't need sign off from a CVS contact. For graduate, masters, you know, PhD students as well as CPS students. You will need this to be signed uh, on both the first. You will see at the very bottom of the page, there's two spots for signatures. Um, you will need it to be signed by your academic advisor and a CVIS contact. Often your advisor is a CVIS contact, so it'll be the same person signing off. Um, but if not, then we need to see that that second, very last signature portion is signed by a CVIS contact. Um, if your advisor does not know if they are, they probably are not. Uh, and they just need to reach out to someone else in their academic department to assist them. Uh, most departments you know have several so it should not be a problem to getting this completed um, but yeah as i mentioned the, you the student will fill out the first portion and then parts two and three will be completed by your academic advisor um, if you're graduating earlier than the program than the program end date listed on your current i-20 we will then we will use this document to shorten your i-20 so your academic advisor will select which date you plan on graduating again if it's after the fall semester here, December 19th, uh, we will end, but your program was planning, or if your specific I-20 was listed as further in the future, we will then make that change, shorten it down. Uh, so there's no other form you need to do to let us know that you're graduating early, earlier than expected. This form kind of does that for you. Okay, great. Thank you, Sam. Um, I'm going to take over from here. Hi again, my name is Alex. Uh, I'm an assistant advisor at OGS. Um, so now that we're digging a little deeper into uh, the application process um, for the recommendation I-20 for OPT um, that you will submit to OGS, um, as Sam talked a little bit about already, um, determining your start date is very important um, because you'll have to request uh, specific dates uh, in your application to OGS. Um, these will be reflected on the recommendation I-20 that we give you and you will use to apply with USAS. So um, it is important to, to make sure that you are choosing the correct dates, since as Sam said, after you submit your application to USAS, you'll no longer um, be able to, to make any changes. Um, so a couple things to consider. Really, it depends on your personal situation, um, what dates are going to be best for you. Uh, keep in mind that chart that we showed earlier. Uh, if you have a job lined up, um, it's all ready to go. Um, you can make the start date um, immediately after um, the end of your program. So that could even be um, you know, the day after the last day of your program. So uh, if we look at um, the fall 2024 semester, and the program end date for um, all semester-based programs uh, for the fall is going to be um, December 20th, so you could make it your OPT requested start date, December 21st. Uh, if you're in a quarter-based program, um, the program end date is going to be December 19th, and so you could make your start date December 20th. Um, on the other hand, uh, if you are still looking for a job, if you anticipate that you will need a little bit more time to look for a job, um, you can uh, make your requested start date up to 60 days um, after your program end date. Um, so anytime within that 60 day grace period. Uh, and so you can see there we have um, the last days of the grace period listed as well for um, the semester. So for the semester, so for the fall semester program, the last day of the 60 day grace period is February 17th. And for quarter based programs, it's February 16th. Um, so yes, it's, it's really just going to depend on um, your personal situation uh, in determining which start date works best for you. Okay, so you've chosen your start date. Um, now you are submitting your um, request to OGS for a recommendation I-20. Uh, so what do you need? You need the certificate of program completion uh, that Sam showed you earlier. Um, that's going to show your intended graduation date and it's signed by your academic advisor and receive his contact. Um, again, that receipt of payment of the 
post-graduation administrative fee, along with your most recent I-94 and a copy of your passport um, biographical page. So uh, you'll find space for those in um, my OGS under OP post OPT Central. Within my OGS, this is going to be a single spot um, where you're going to handle a lot of the requests um, regarding OPT um, throughout the time that, that you're on OPT. Um, and also at the end of the presentation, we'll have a link to our website, which will also have a link to um, my OGS and OPT Central. Okay, um, let's continue to the next slide. Thank you. Um, right, so the first step again is um, submitting the I-20 request form to OGS with your select the start and end dates. Uh, our processing time is about 10 to 15 business days. Um, when it is approved by OGS, we will send you that recommendation I-20 and you will use that recommendation I-20 to apply with USCIS um, and that is the I-765 um, form and, and just very important to remember you need to submit your application to USCIS within 30 days of receiving the recommendation I-20 um, from OGS. If it's been more than 30 days um, submit another request to OGS, we will make an, another recommendation and you will um, be able to apply with that one. But do not apply with the old one because USCIS will deny your application. Okay, next slide please. Okay, so um, of course we hope everything goes right and if you follow our directions it should be a very smooth process. Um, but what are some uh, common reasons for denial of OPT by USCIS? Um, number one is, again, um, receiving uh, applications that include a recommendation I-20 that is more than 30 days old. Um, and again, if that is the case for you, just request a new recommendation from OGS instead of submitting your uh, application to USCIS with an outdated I-20. Um, second is outside the 150-day application window. So again, that's 90 days before your program end date and then the 60-day grace period after your program end date. Um, and yes, keep in mind those are, um, I did see a question about this, keep in mind that is counted just straight days, not business days, anything. It is 90 days um, before and 60 days after. Um, Another common one is no recommendation I-20. Um, if you don't request that from us first, uh, most likely your, um, your OPT application with USCIS will be denied. Um, no signature on the I-765, which is the USCIS application, um, an undeliverable address on the same, and then um, a problem with, with the fee payment um, that is part of I-765. So that is the, do keep in mind that is a separate fee, um, that is the USCIS fee. Um, and then when you request the recommendation I-20 from OGS, there's the post-graduation administrative fee um, from Northeastern. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so um, that's it about the application process. So let's talk a little bit about what life looks like uh, while you're on OPT. Uh, so as long as you have uh, followed the above directions for submitting your application to USCIS um, within the, the specified window of time, um, you are maintaining your F1 status in the US after your grace period ends. Um, and most likely you will be in this position because the USCIS um, processing times can be several months um, so it, it might be after your 60-day grace period um, before your uh, OPT application is um, processed by USAS. So after OPT is approved um, your main responsibility is going to be reporting your employment. So uh, 
when the OPT is approved by USAS, you will get access to um, the SEVP portal. And this is um, a website where you'll make an account and it will allow you to um, report your employment. Uh, and any changes in employment, any new employers, uh, it needs to be reported within 10 days of um, within 10 days of the update, um, as well as um, an address change. Uh, on the other hand, there are a few things that you will need to uh, report to OGS. Um, so one, if you are choosing to end your OPT early and leave the country, um, there is an e-form for that in my OGS. You'll be able to report that to us. And also for address changes that um, happen after your program end date, but before your OPT begins. Um, and that's very important because um, you need to make sure your address is updated because you will need to receive um, the EAD card in the mail physically. So best practices, um, checking your email frequently, not the most fun, but very necessary. Um, Keeping in mind reporting timelines has to be within any changes in employment address need to be reported within 10 days. Um, any issues you have accessing that SUVP portal where you're able to report your own um, employment address changes, um, please report that to us and we can help you um, regain access if there's any issue there. And most importantly, don't wait until the last minute. That goes for everything here. Um, goes for submitting your applications um, for OPT, goes for reporting, um, just, you know, more preparation, the more preparation, the better, really. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so employment um, on OPT. Before you start working, there are a couple conditions that um, you must have uh, completed, um, otherwise you you cannot start working. So it's three conditions and all, all of them need to be um, true. So the first is USCIS has approved your application um, and you'll be able to see that in the online portal uh, after you submit your application to USCIS. Um, there will be a tracker with updates on your, on your application. Um, Number two, and this is very important, you have physically received uh, your EAD card. Um, so, uh, you know, you may see online that your OPT has been approved, uh, but you still need to wait until you've received the physical EAD card before you start working. And then three, uh, that the start date of your OPT, and that will be listed on your EAD, um, has passed already. Um, so, approved EAD in hand and start date on that EAD uh, has passed. All those um, need to be the case before you start working. And then the most important um, employment requirement uh, for OPT is that it needs to be directly related to your field of study and appropriate to your degree level. Uh, and then it needs to also be a minimum of 20 hours a week. So, it can be um, any any number of hours um, beyond that. So just a minimum of 20. And then also um, over the course of um, your period of OPT, uh, usually that'll be a year, um, you cannot exceed uh, 90 days of unemployment. So um, that 90 days um, is counted from the start date um, that USCIS approves That'll be the start date that's on your EAD. Um, and it is your responsibility to um, keep track of uh, the number of days of unemployment um, that you have accumulated. Um, if you do exceed 90 days of unemployment, um, unfortunately, you will have to leave um, the US as you have, um, as your OPT will have ended. Um, so, yes, that starts counting from the date that's on your EAD card. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so other than the, the requirements that you saw on the last slide, um, there is some flexibility for employment on OPT. Um, it can be either paid or unpaid. Um, so that means things like 
um, like an internship, for example, um, as long as it's appropriate for a degree, uh, it's it could be valid employment for OPT. You can have multiple employers. Um, it just cumulatively you need to um, have at least 20 hours a week. And um, as long as all of them are directly related to your program of study, you can also be self-employed if you choose to start your own business. Um, you'll need to consult an attorney um, that specializes in uh, in business startups, um, but you do have the ability to do that. Um, you can also be employed through an agency or consulting firm or as a contractor. Um, you might you might often hear of, of 1099 employment as an independent contractor. That type of employment is also allowed on OPT. Um, so that's temporary contract work. You can also change employers uh, as long as you're not um, exceeding that 90 days of unemployment over the course of um, your OPT period and you can work remotely. Okay, next slide, please. All right, and then uh, traveling uh, while on OPT. So there are a few things that um, you'll need to bring with you in order to, to travel um, easily and smoothly uh, while you're on OPT. So um, a lot of it is, is the same documentation that you've brought uh, as a student. So um, of course your passport, which, needs, which should be valid for at least six months after your date of return to the US. And it should have your visa as well. If you have a new passport, you should have your old passport that has the visa in it as well. Um, you'll need an I-20 that has um, the OPT recommendation as well as um, a travel signature on page two. Um, now do keep in mind, this is a change from when you are an active student. Uh, while you're on OPT, the tr your travel signature on your I-20 is only valid for six months rather than a year. Um, so do keep that in mind, um, but it is the same process. You can just request a new uh, travel signature from OGS and it'll be valid for the next six months. Um, and then you'll need your EAD card and uh, also recommended as proof of employment. So generally that'll be um, the offer letter you received from your company um, when you started with them. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, and this is very important. Uh, if your program end date has passed and you don't have an EAD card, um, OGS highly recommends that you do not travel during that time. Um, that is because uh, you will not have all the documentation that you need to travel. Um, as I highlighted on the last slide there, the EAD, you, you need the EAD in order to um, return to the US. So after your program end date, um, if your OPT application with USCIS is, is still pending, um, we highly recommend that you do not travel as you could face difficulties um, returning to the country um, and, and consequences for your OPT application. Um, so uh, our, the OGS recommendation is to not leave the country until you have received uh, your EAD card. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, um, so that's it from us. Um, we will take a few minutes to answer um, questions uh, that are put in the question section here. Um, there's QR code, this is our contact information. Um, please give us a call, uh, come visit us in Richards Hall, 354. Uh, we have, well, we always have someone at the front desk. Uh, that's one who talk about your individual situation. Uh, as well as walk-in advising hours, Monday, Wednesday, Friday from 10 to 12, and uh, Tuesday, Thursday from 1 to 3. Um, and then this, the QR code on this page will bring you to uh, our website page about post-completion OPT. I can't recommend that highly enough. Um, it has a lot of good information. It'll walk you step-by-step -step through requirements, application process, um, everything. It also has links to um, all of the um, documentation and requests that you'll need um, during the OPT application process. Um, so 
any of those resources, please use them. Um, that's what we're here for. Um, and we're going to take maybe a minute to answer some questions um, that have to do some general questions about OPT. If you have questions about your individual situation, um, we're not really going to be answering those. Um, so we would encourage you to um, reach out to OGS so we can um, connect individually. Okay, um, Okay. here's a question. Does pre-OPT affect the two-year STEM extension? So pre-OPT, um, I think as Sam covered, um, it does it does affect um, how much time uh, you can take in, in post-completion OPT, which is that, um, that one year total that you have, um, which can be split between pre-OPT or post-OPT. Um, so if if you've used you know a month of a full time uh, pre OPT for example you would be able to apply for 11 months of post completion OPT. However, if your degree is STEM eligible, um, you are still eligible to apply for the two year STEM extension, um, regardless of if you have used uh, pre OPT. And another question about OPT, about pre-OPT. Um, if you have been uh, proof for, if you've worked uh, part-time pre-OPT, um, and that's that's less than 20 hours a week, um, you have been approved for one or the other, um, then that counts as as half time for the purposes of um, the year of OPT that you have. So, um, for example, if if you were approved for two months of part-time pre-OPT, um, then there would be, then you could apply for 11 months of um, full-time post-completion OPT. So I think we're going to leave it there and pass it over to our colleagues um, at the um, career office. Hi there. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Alan. Perfect. Okay. Wonderful. Um, and great. Okay. So, um, so, um, and can you see me? Not really. Interesting. It says unable to share webcam. Not quite sure what to make of that. Um, and just hold on a moment. Let's see if we can get that fixed. Um, and let's see. Not sure why I can't be seen, but, um, hmm. let's see. Hmm, I'm not sure why I can't be seen, but <laughs> I can, I can be heard, correct? So, okay, so we'll just, we'll just go on, I guess not quite sure because it says people can see you but obviously that's not the case <laughs> so hi everybody i'm sorry i can't be on camera um, my name is ellen Sol goldman and i am with employer engagement and career design and um and so we're located in the stearns building which is right the building with all of the colorful sculptures um, and so I'm just really excited to be here and kind of talk with you a little bit today. Um, and so if you want to pop to the next sli slide, this is what we're going to talk about. Um, so we're, we're going to kind of talk a little bit about, um, you know, some of the 
services and resources, but really honestly, I really want to be here to talk a little bit about the employer kind, the types of employer events and how you can leverage them. And then maybe a little bit about some cross-cultural differences that could be useful um, for you, especially there's there's lots of differences of, of when we think about the um, salary negotiation, resumes and all this kind of thing. So we'll do a little bit of everything. All right, so next, um, so you're going to see um, the team. So um, and we are we hiring a couple of people. So we're going to be expanding. So it's just not me alone here. So I want to just let you know that um, that um, when you come to Career Design and our services are virtual and we're also in person, then you're going to be able to um, interact with a variety of people depending on when you do that. So um, so absolutely. Um, just know that um, that we um, that we have a staff of that of folks that are really student driven, um, and that you have um, career services for um, for life for free. So uh, so I think that's that's also something to kind of think about. So um, great. All right. And um, all right. And then next, um, in terms of um, in terms of what we help with, these are some of the things that we help with. But to be honest, if there's a career concern of any type, um, we're happy to help. So if you want help practicing um, how to talk about your OPT with an employer, we're happy to do that. Anything related to like, am I eligible related to OPT or how do I apply? Absolutely, we defer to our colleagues in OGS, which I really love working with. Um, so, um, but we'll help you with the career piece. Um, so next, great, okay. Um, so this is, and I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on the career resources piece, but um, this is um, this is kind of our, our schedule. So if you are here today but you're kind of curious about how to deal with salary negotiation you can go to that coaching lab and then you can come see us individually through the career studio and we can always set up an appointment same thing with interviewing you can you can um you know do practice interviews with us and you can pop into the studio virtually or in person um, for drop-in, no appointment needed, but we can also set up appointments and you can see our schedule right there. So that's just really important to know. We kind of are running things from 12 to 6 every day. Great. All right. Um, so I know it's just really hard these days, right? Everyone's getting sadly um scam emails and and scam texts and we 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 know this has uh not fun impacts so we just want to let you know that if you receive something from career design from our office uh, we could because we do a newsletter we'll communicate with you we actually never have you click on links um that are not um like that are in an email you would always have to go to nu works to um to get the job so i just want to make sure that everybody knows that and obviously you can google the company and scam there's all sorts of things we can teach you we're going to be offering some workshops related to um avoiding or protecting yourself against job search scams but just know that um they're spoofing our logo sometimes now so if you think it's from us but you're, it's asking you to click on a link then uh, it's not from us great and now we're going to go into the fun stuff um so and i i changed my uh, webcam settings so i'm hoping that maybe somebody can see me but if not it's then um We'll just continue this way. So yeah, we can see you now, Alan. Beautiful. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Um, um, so, so now we're going to talk a little bit more about um, leveraging employer events. This is the stuff I really wanted to be here today to to share with you. So there are a lot of different ways that you can um, connect with employers, and we're going to talk a little bit about some of these now um husky tracks i'm gonna i'm gonna um show you some examples um but really so that you kind of know um so husky tracks are 
they're um, basically tours of companies. Um, it could be virtual, some are virtual, some are in person. Um, you usually meet alumni, um, you usually hear from a panel, usually hear from the recruiters. Um, but in addition, um, they're, you're working on something experiential, whether it's a case study, whether it's a project, a mini project. So those are really cool and they're offered throughout the year. Inspire, um, we have a lot, whoops, you can go back, sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Inspire is um, a great service because um, we know that there are resources like LinkedIn, right, and any source where alumni um, and students can connect. But um, a lot of times we hear it's really hard, like somebody look at my outreach, nobody's getting back to me, how do I find the right people? Um, what does this have for impact? What do I do next? So we're, we offer a service where you, we can help you with all of that. Um, so Forage, I don't know if anybody's heard of Forage, anybody, if anybody's heard of Forage on this um, webinar, if you haven't, you can come and talk with me if you wanna learn more or with anybody in the Career Studio. Forage is great because um, it's simulated projects like the ones that they give employees quote, posted by companies. Um, it's free for you. You see a video you get all from the company. You get all the tools you need to do the project. There's about 250 or so, maybe a little bit more developed. Um, and then when you when you click and it's and it's the projects are usually like between two and five hours, depending on the project. And when you click submit, you see what, um, how an employee at the company would have completed that project. So you can upskill, you can also look at how somebody else would have done that. They give you exactly the language, the, employ the employer, the company gives you exactly the language that you would, um, that you could put on your resume under projects. You can't put it under experience because you don't, the company is not checking your work. Um, they're, um, they're, they're, they're not giving you a reference or anything like that, but you would put it under projects. And, and you also could put it on your LinkedIn, which is really great. And when you do the project, you can make your profile viewable by the company to have them reach out to say, hi, I see that there are some there that you've, you know, you've completed this project in analytics or in whatever the case is. Um, and, um, and we're reaching out to you to let you know about positions that are posted. And it helps you with confidence, I think, in, in, um, in talking about why you want to work at that company, because you've already done a project like the ones that they, sign, they, they give their employees. So come see us if you're interested in learning more about that. You can do as many as you want. And if you have questions, you can put those in the chat, in the Q&A. Um, so, um, any view, I'm going to skip because um, as folks who are graduating, this is really more for students who are exploring. Um, and, um, and then you can see all of our events on, um, on the events page or on NUWorks. So, all right, now next. Thank you. Love it. All right. So, Perfect. All right. So I, in my experience, um, some students know about some of these, some students don't know about some of these, so I really want to cover them. Um, so these are, um, some of them are really meaningful opportunities for you to talk with an employer. So for example, the employer in residence I want to talk about first, because it's an employer who volunteers um, and our employer team is talking with employers all the time and they will be scheduling these. So it's an opportunity for you either one-on-one -on -one to sign up to talk with an employer or up to three people at a time to talk with that employer about anything. It's sort of like flash mentorship if you think about it that way. Um, so, or on the spot mentorship. And you can, you can talk about them, you know, talk with them about like, how do I negotiate salary? You can talk with them about, I'm really interested in the intersection of this area and this area. 
You can have them take a look at your resume. It's really an opportunity for you to get some mentorship from um, employers and some coaching from them. So when you see those, definitely consider signing up for them because those are really small, um, like one-on-one -on -one or one-on-three opportunities. Coffee chats, um, if you've been um, kind of in Curry, um, right by the info desk, um, employers will, um, we just were talking with an employer this week who's going to be setting up. Um, they're they're going to be right near Campus Crossroads, right by the info desk, and you can just chat with them, um, bring your bubble tea, bring your coffee, whatever, and just chat with them because they really are looking to talk with students um, more one-on-one. -on -one. It's, 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 it's just an opportunity for you to talk with them about their company, about open roles that you saw posted, so that you don't feel like you're applying in online and not hearing anything. At least you can, at least you can talk with them a little bit about um, the kinds of questions that you um, wanna um, get answers to. So it's a really good opportunity and they really love it. Um, and it's a very popular thing. And then employer connection sessions, some of those can be fairly large depending on the company, um, but um, they really make opportunities almost like a, um, an information session um, to give in more information and to do Q&A in a, in a more group fashion. So those are some things that I really wanted to make sure that you all knew about um, and to use them because they're great opportunities to kind of get the answers to the test, so to speak, and not have to worry about like just wondering um, if you if you should follow up, when you should follow up. So they won't know your application, um, but um, but they will be able to answer questions and give you coaching. So great. So next, <clears throat> and then you can go. One more. Okay. Uh, okay. There should be a different slide, but that's fine. All right. So, um, so here's some. Here's like two different introductions. So I kind of want to have you take a look at those and just sort of read them through. And so take a look right now at example one, and take a look at example two, and then tell me which one you think is um, better. So. We're going to take a minute and have you do that. So for folks that um, can just, instead of putting the question in the chat, just put the number in the, in the question section, number one or number two do you prefer? And you can just take a minute and just put that right in there. Number one or number two, which one do you think is better? Number two, I see. Yeah, keep going. Yeah, I wanna hear a couple more people. Number one, number two. Okay, number two. All right, great, all right. Number two is is better. Um, and the, the reason is because it's more specific um, and so, um, and so very interested in creating strategies, right? Um, and for new products, I understand that Google's fo focusing on a new product line. Um, and then thinking about, you know, what they did as a, as an intern that was related or as a co-op and then ending with, um, with a sentence. Um, is uh, ending with a question is super helpful. So it's really open, it's really open-ended. Um, and so this is kind of when you're thinking about like introducing yourself at a coffee chat, introducing yourself at employer in residence, introducing yourself at any number of employer facing opportunities. Um, think about, think about um, focusing uh, really on like the connect between, uh, actually what I tell, whoops, what I tell students is this, I tell an alum, think about it as your present, your past and your future. So here's where you're at right now, graduating right with this area. 
here's a little bit about your past that's connected, right? Um, and your future. Um, and if you want to flip those and do and do present, future, past, that's fine too. But you just you don't want to you don't want to memorize it. It needs to feel organic. And then if you can end with a question, that's really really helpful. Um, and that just gives you a sense of it. We can always practice the career studio. Easy peasy. We'll help you there. Great. Okay. So here are some strategies that and tips for your conversation um, and just to uh, be able to optimize it because it's so important to be able to optimize those conversations for that time that you're that you're there the employer and residence you can schedule like half hour you can it's it's not just a little tiny few minutes right some of them are longer than others but what you want to do is you want to come prepared by having looked at the company ahead of time and looking at the any jobs they have posted that you're interested in um, and having kind of some of your questions maybe looking them up a little bit doing a little bit of research on them um, and then it's really about sort of making those relationships and those connections um, and so you can actually ask them things like, you know, I'm really interested in applying to this role, but I saw that there was a finance one and a finance two role posted. Um, this happened with some of my students when I was working with um, with students, uh, graduate students at another school in business. And um, one particular company, Raymond James, was like they used to post things that were so close they look like the same almost identical job description and so you can ask them you know for somebody with my background do would you suggest that i would be a better fit um, for the the one position or the two position um, you can ask which skills in keywords you can ask them a little bit about um, what they're um, you know what they're hoping that you could maybe do from looking at your resume and chatting with you to make yourself an even stronger candidate. You can get a timeline and sort of what their hiring process is like for interviewing. Um, you can ask them if they think your background looks like it could be a fit. All of those things are really important. So think like literally I think about it like asking the employer like getting the answers to the test is really how I is really how I think about it you can ask them if there are any positions in the like coming up that maybe haven't been posted yet that they think might be posted in the near future um, and so all of those things are things that you that you can talk about with them and that will help you maximize your your interaction with them and again, if you have any questions, you can put them in the Q&A and we'll definitely talk about those too. Um, so next, thank you. All right, who hires international students, right? So it was just in a coaching lab for this um, because we do a weekly coaching lab on Wednesdays from uh, 12 to one and it's um, one, um, one week a month is in person and three weeks a month are virtual. Um, and we'll go over resources um, and strategies um, with you for identifying employers who have a track record. Of, so for example, um, uh, Going Global, which is a resource that we pay for you to, um, we pay for you to have, which is password protected behind NUWorks. So you have to log into NUWorks in order to access it. Um, they have OPT friendly employers. They have 23 pages of OPT friendly employers. That is employers who have had a track record of a hiring um, talent on OPT. And definitely this is this is a list I would really strongly encourage you to utilize. Um, the American sort of student um, is going to is not on a visa, is going to spend their limited time with the employer talking about their intellectual capital um, that they would bring to the position. So I I think sometimes when when you talk about it looks like it would be efficient to ask them if they take international students but it's not effective because they don't know you yet and um 
and sometimes they're the particular person who's interfacing might not know um, and sometimes it depends within a company on some positions versus others so I wouldn't spend your time that way I would go and do the research on going global and also my visa jobs and um, and I think that really enables you um, in in ways to that you wouldn't ordinarily have if you're you wouldn't have that time that's precious time so do that that helps you with targeting um, so that you can cross reference that list also that list also has open positions at that company and it also has whether that company has done h1b's before and for what so um, definitely use going global also there's great city guides and country uh, well city guides and country guides too but city guides on there in case you're in a different location um, and within the united states um, and um, in other countries as well they have country guides as well um, the other advice i would give you is not to apply to your a-level companies your top companies and then wait um, because the your B level and C level employers, do you know what I mean by that? Those are the companies that are like your second tier, third tier. They will already have hired. So honestly, I would apply to both your A and B and C level companies, and then um, and then really see where your best opportunity is. Um, it's a tough market, so I definitely wouldn't dagger anything I would do things at the same time also I've had many many students over the years who um, took an interview for practice thinking they would never take the job um, but then actually that employer really looked like they had a great they had great chemistry with that employer and uh, it worked out and I've and they ended up taking a job that they didn't think they were going to take so um, just because once they got into the interview process with the employer they were like or with the manager they were like oh my goodness this is really a good opportunity so use my visa jobs use going global in these ways come to the coaching labs like leading your job search um, just so you get everything that um, every student gets and then come to the international student one as well um, so um, and then there's other things we'll teach you in that lab so as well for strategies great okay so here what I really want to share here is no matter what opportunity that is employer facing that you participate in um, y'all probably know this do a thank you after within 24 hours and it's a great opportunity for you to 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 share like something that you chatted about with the employer that you saw their eyes like light up I sort of idiom for you saw them get enthusiastic um, uh, or that maybe they were encouraging you um, to do something and you follow through and you can let them know um, so it's an opportunity also to um, besides thanking them to like we all leave those interactions and we say oh my god I wish I had mentioned this and that's an opportunity for you to mention that thing that you forgot that you really wanted them to know so um, as well as you know um, to kind of reiterate your your interest um, so that would be my advice. We will look at your thank yous. We will look at your cover letters. We will look at your resumes. Um, we'll do anything that supports you um, through this process. Great. Thank you. This is um, interesting. I included this because um, this is a heat map of where the employer's eyes go um, when they're looking at your resume. Um, and I've got just a couple of slides on that just for folks who um, might be interested. It's really kind of interesting. So they kind of look at your um, your resume. You can see that their eyes go to like the, the address. Your LinkedIn is going to be a part of that heat map. You don't have to have a summary. Um, it absolutely do not have to have a summary unless you have the exact industry sort of technical qualifications that they're asking for for experience but in general if you picture this as the letter f or the letter e 
that is how they're doing it. So they give most weight on the left-hand side, and then you can see through this heat map that they're skipping and skimming through your resume doing what we call spotting, looking for particular things. So they skip big chunks of text. So in, in general, we find bullets work better, um, and that bullet shouldn't be more than two lines um, long, and it should be super cluttered um and to make it easy for them by having things really consistently like on the left hand side with your accomplishments or achievements or impact um because they're really looking at that left more good all right and then we're going to talk a little bit about fonts so um these are really the best um kind of fonts that in terms of the recruiters and the best performing resumes really used really clear fonts. So um, so I think it would be really helpful for you. I thought it would be really helpful for you to know, usually sans, sans serif. Um, and we have resume labs and you can bring your resume to the career studio. And if you're not getting um, any, um, you know, feedback back from employers, we could take a look at that and, and kind of give you a sense of what might be going on. It might be that you're um, missing something that um, you were holding back to think that you were gonna use it in an interview and we want you to include it on your resume. Um, so, or it might be something that we can just help, we, we, we usually can help find things that would be useful. Um, and these days you're probably augmenting it as well with, with connecting with employers through those events and networking and your and other ways too. But those are just some ideas. Okay, wonderful. Next. All right. So now we're just gonna kind of get more into the cross-cultural um, pieces just to give you some kind of tips. Um, and um, it's not just gonna be about resumes, just so that you know. Um, so typically, I'm not going to read this slide because that you wouldn't need me to do that. Um, um, and but you really are thinking about what the relevant experience is, and the biggest difference, of course, and those of you who have done co-op know this, is that one-page resume. Um, unless you really have, um, you know, five to ten plus years of relevant experience. Um, so, um, so again. Summaries are optional. Lately, I've been seeing a lot of um, worked as um, or worked with, and we would encourage you to um, to not use that particular word because it's so generic. It's really hard for them to know what that what you did there. Did you were you key partner um, for a specific um, you know uh, vendor or account? Um, how, how did, were you an internal consultant? Like work with is really, really a tough word to use. Um, and really the eye tracking and focus groups with employers really confirm that more than a two page resume just does not perform well, um, except for the academic job search. That's different because you would use a CV. Um, and so you're really looking for you know, reduced client, you know, reduced losses by X percent or expanded clients or streamlined things that things that are really more concrete. Um, so and also templates are really difficult um, because you can't change them as those of you probably use them know when you go to update them. Um, we have big interview, so I would use big interview because you can put your resume in um, and a job description in and see how well the ATS matches and also job scan. You can use five times free per email address and that's on our website, so you don't have to pay. But there's over 400 applicant tracking systems out there. So um, you can also use um, ChatGPT. I work with students all the time and say, put in ChatGPT, what applicant, what ATS system does X company use and get some tips for is it should should it be a PDF should it be a DOCX what what do they read what don't they read um, so so it's totally fine to do that absolutely great thank you okay so job search I this uh, this comes up a lot because it's so challenging isn't it I mean you're 
trying to keep faith in the job search, right? Um, you're wondering if you haven't heard, when do you follow up? If you've been interviewed and usually it's like, yes, we wanna make the decision like shortly uh, by next week. And then you don't hear from them by the end of next week and you're trying to figure that out. So so, um, so usually um, keep it positive. So you wanna put like this in the subject line, you know, status of, you know, X, Y, Z role, um you want to um think about like waiting a week doing you know if they usually have reached out to you by email then whatever way they've reached out to you before you can uh you can email them back if it was email call them if it was a call and then wait a week if you don't hear back do one more follow-up um and then just uh really let it go um because um a lot of times um, things move slower than they they want because they just you know they're short staffed. So things uh, and recruiters these days are really really um, overwhelmed with the easy apply um, you know button. So you just really kind of they're get they're just getting a ton of resumes. So so you really want to kind of think about can you do some back channel with maybe. Um, Northeastern alum or with us or with to find out who the person really is. If you're applying on any works, those folks really, really want Northeastern, like Northeastern applicants. So they're taking the time to apply specifically um, on any works or handshake if you're on the West Coast. Um, so um, definitely this would be kind of the etiquette and it's um, there are some cultural differences, even in terms of wording. So ha where it might make an, a candidate sound aggressive when the candidate doesn't actually mean to sound aggressive. So have your correspondence reviewed by us. Um, if, you, if you think that would be helpful, we think that we would encourage you to do that because um, we definitely hear um, that um, and we definitely see that we can help with that. So bring us a draft. We're happy to help. Um, cover letter, resume, you know, cover letter, any kind of any kind of correspondence at all. Great. Okay. And then next. Um, so if you want to move to the next slide, it's not okay. Good. I thought maybe it was not going for me. So all right. So. Here, here are some differences in interviewing. So I do a lot of mock interviews. I love doing mock interviews. I'm not the only one here who does them. Everybody does them. Um, and there are some things that we can see over time. So in some cultures, um, in some cultures, you wouldn't express um, enthusiasm the same way. Um, I once had an employer and uh, really interestingly, the employer came out after a couple of interviews and said, you know, if you're talking to um, the this past student and the student before, can you let them know that I didn't really think that they wanted the job, so we're not gonna move forward with them. Well, unbeknownst to that employer, I had talked with those students as they left um, the office next door where the employer was interviewing and the student was like, I really love this role, so I really hope I get the next interview. So what, what I've learned over the course of time in working with international students is that um, an American is going to say, I'm really excited about this role. They're going to sound really excited. Um, and, um, and we don't think about it like begging. It's totally fine if it's a first choice role to say that. Um, and so in showing your enthusiasm is partly verbal, right? And it's also varying your pitch so the um so you can tell my voice goes up and down so you want to make sure when you're interviewing um that that you're coming across in that way everybody's different right everybody's different so i would just throw that out there um as some tips to think about um you know and then really in some cultures um you know the culturally you go from general to more specific um but here um you would really need to go straight directly to the best that you have related to answering that question um and then you can say in addition so it's the opposite um 
long-term goals, my experience is that a lot of students think about, when they're asked about long-term goals, right, um, thinking international students, because you're from different cultures, um, a lot of times it's tempting to think geographically where you want to be long term, um, but um, I wouldn't do that. Things change and instead they're really looking for like what you want to do career progression wise. Where do you want to go within that field after that position? And, and does that connect to um, their position? Does your long term goal connect Oh, you can go back. Does your long-term goal connect to that particular position? Um, and then, um, and then I just I, I always say this. It's so true that um, that employers do not necessarily really care about the accent. Um, if if it, it's really not about the accent, so don't don't be really proud. And as long as you're you're able to make yourself understood. Um, I have some students that will minimize their answers not to make mistakes. Um, and um, it, it, they, it's really hard to get the job if um, you're not elaborating. So come in for practice interviewers and practice interviews and we'll, we'll, do, we'll do more in-depth um, work with you to take an, maybe an interview that's an a and tell you it's an A or take an interview that's an A minus and help you get to that A. So I've had a lot of students lately that have made it to like second interviews, but not have made it through. So always if you're finding that you're um, not making it through and you've had more than a couple um, come in for a mock and even if you practice and even if you haven't come in. So we're happy to do that. We'll create a one hour time for you. Um, so, um, and so you can go next, sorry. <laughs> so, my bad. All right, so evaluating offers. All right, so this is really interesting because um, whether you've done co-op or not, um, offers in general, your co-op coordinator has a sense for what that company is offering. Then it's after graduation jobs and you're thinking, I am not sure this is my first time through. So. I'm going to give you a couple of, of tips, but there's a salary negotiation lab, coaching lab that I love teaching and that other people here teach really well. Um, and so a couple of things. So a verbal acceptance the US to the employer means that you've accepted. So you just need to know that if you verbally accept, then you've accepted the job and should be withdrawing from other interviews. In order to avoid that, um, I would, I would, I would say, you know, say I'm when you get a job offer, say, you know, I'm really excited about this. This is a great opportunity. When can I let you know? Or how does it work from here? This is my first time through the process. Or will you be, you know, well, can I get back to you if I have questions? So you have to kind of get that second part in there really quickly so that they don't think that you're accepting the job verbally. And we wouldn't advise accepting the job right on the spot or right there in that moment, because usually you hang up and then people ask you questions, you know, like, oh, I didn't really, I don't really know. I didn't really think about that. Um, and now you wanna go back to them with, um, with um, different kinds of questions to help you evaluate it. And it's too, it, you can do that, but you can't withdraw because you've accepted. So don't, we wouldn't, ex, we wouldn't advise you to accept on the spot because compensation is just one piece of an overall, um, an overall offer. And um, two companies that are offering, let's say, eighty thousand, um, can one can, in real money, if if one pays for your healthcare a hundred percent and one you can park for free, and the other you have to pay 30% for your healthcare, and you're paying 2,000 for parking, those are not the same offer. So, so just, um, just make, make sure that, um, that you come in and practice, go to the salary negotiation coaching lab, practice, um, come in if you have an offer. Um, students do this all the time, and we look at the offer together. Um, and never sign anything if you don't understand exactly what you're signing. So those are some, just some 
just some tips. Um, and I had a student the other day who asked me if when they're on probation with a company, if they um, are, um, like if they pay them less money. And the answer is no, not in the US. Um, the probationary period is just like a three month usually period or a period in which, um, you know, they're looking to see your performance, but they pay you the same. And so feel free to ask those questions of us because we'll be happy to help answer. Great. Um, this is cool. This is the NU Place is a really neat. It's um, on our website in Career Design, which is so we have NU Works and we have our own website, Career Design. So both of those. Um, and so NU Place is the intersection of career and identity. And for many of us, right, we have multiple identities. So you might be an international student and the first in your family to go to college. Um, you might be an international student and identify as Latinx. So there are resources for different identities and um, related to career and jobs. So definitely scope out that on our website so that you can kind of see what possibilities exist for, um, for you to add to the regular resources that everybody else knows and gets. And you can go to the next slide. Great. And so that, um, that kind of concludes like the formal, but I left some time for questions and answers, both for 